unaussprechlichen Rampe. My name is Marco Visconti, and through this podcast I will invite fellow magicians, occultists, artists, and mystics to rumble along with them and my supporters on Patreon. By doing so, I hope to introduce you all to a much wider perspective on magic and what we get nowadays from occult social media, which is frankly beginning to feel very stale, repetitive, and uninspired. If you want to be part of one of the next episodes, Join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Marco Visconti by pledging at the Yezod tier or above. And now, on with the unspeakable rumbles. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of uh, Uno Sprechigen Rumblen. Uh, this is like the 12th unspeakable rumble, and this is going to be a very good one tonight because we have none other than magician and author Jason Miller. As usual, I will introduce Jason the way he introduced himself. Jason Miller, or Inominandum, has devoted 35 years to studying practical magic in its many forms. He is the author of six books, including the now classic Protection and Reversal Magic. He teaches several courses online, including the Strategic Sorcery One-Year Course, the Sorcery of Ecate Training, and the Black School of St. Cyprian. He lives with his wife and children in the mountains of Vermont. And you can find more uh, about Jason on uh, strategicsorcery.net, but I'm sure Jason will tell us more later. Uh, hello, Jason. How's it going? It's going great, Marco. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Uh, it's, it's, we, here in London, we are in that moment of the year where it, it's, it wants to be summer, but you know, the UK cannot do summer very well. So it's been raining every day and it's uh, quite cold. <laughs> how's, it, how's it over there in Vermont? We're, well, you know, Vermont doesn't really have a spring. We have mud, uh, <laughs> literally called mud season. So we're out of mud season. And summer is here, so just one day, the like the mountain, the snow is gone. Everything is just brown sticks, and then boom, everything is green. I think I think we started the best British way possible, talking about the weather. And of course, I'm not British, you know, right? But I've been living here for a while. I guess I guess I just you know by osmosis, I just got it. But we're here to talk about your new book tonight, Consorting with Spirits. It just came out and it's, it's been a success. Can you tell us a little bit how this book came to be? What's its genesis? Why did you decide to write this book? Well, you know, um, throughout, my, throughout my, my journeys in magic, there have been, there have been, I've met with a lot of people who work with spirits, but I've met with a lot of people who love spirits. Who, who are really, you know, they don't just work with spirits. They, they, they have deep, profound, and lasting relationships with them. Friendships, right? Where, where instead of like a tit for tat, where you keep track of who owes you what, it's like it's bad form to do that because there's so much back and forth. Uh, Louis Martinet is, is one. Uh, Judica Eel. Uh, is another. She introduced me, in fact, to St. Sarah, uh, uh, Sarah La Cali. Today is her feast day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, down in France, Roma people are, are uh, taking her statue and dipping it in the ocean. And then some will take their crystal balls and dip them in the ocean at the same time. It's awesome. Um, but, you know, that's, that's kind of how I experience spirit spirits rather than looking at a book and thinking okay well this is what i need this is the right column and spirit for this i think what spirits do i already have a relationship with what what spirits do i work with and so be they big spirits who are named in grimoires or theologies or or little spirits of the land where i live that that no one knows the name of but me if even I know their name, yeah. you know? Um, heck, half the people in town that I know, I can't remember their names. I'm just like, hey, yeah. you. <laughs> you know, teacher that taught my kid in fourth grade, um, Mrs. Uh, you know, so whatever works. But I, I wanted to write a book about how spirit work really plays out 
when it's part of your life, when it's part of your existence. And and what spirits are, in my opinion, um, in, in a very loose and sloppy way, the loosest and sloppiest way possible. And and then to you know to kind of just let people know, hey, um, spirits are more subtle than people, not less. So the idea that you can nail them down and say, spirits are this, spirits are that, spirits like this, spirits don't like that, is just asinine. Like if they, if people can't be narrowed down like this, why would you think spirits can be just pigeonholed like this? But so that's why I wrote the book. And, and of course, you know, there's always like cool magic tech and stuff that I want to get like, where does it go? Does it, yeah, does it go in a blog post? Does it go in a course? Does it go in a book? So there's stuff that was like, this would be perfect for the book. And that had to get out as well. It's interesting that you already made a point that I agree a whole utterly, the fact that, you know, spirits are real, right? Like if we want to engage with the spirit world, we must to consider them as, as real as me and you, right? Like as real as people, right? And, with, and, and engaging with them like we would do. Um, of course, you know, defining what's real, I would say maybe it's one of the big questions of humanity and it's a one question that maybe magicians or the, everybody who works in the spiritual world wants to try and tackle. But over the years, uh, I mean, maybe less now, but definitely when I was growing up, you know, in the 90s, um, there was this, this real uh, almost movement into try and reduce the entirety of magical experience to psychological quirks. And so spirits became part of your mind. Uh, maybe, you know, the, the shadow part of your mind, the, the secret part of your mind. Um, what do you say about that? How, I mean, it's pretty clear that you don't see it like that. And by, by all means, I don't. But what, what's your take on those or, or those ideas, the, those theories that still want to see a psychological model of magic as opposed to a spirit model of magic, right? Well, you know, um, well, it's a big question. So, so first of all, we've got this idea of like, what's real? Spirits are as real as you and I are. And then, which is to say, in an ultimate sense, not real at all. <laughs> like, hard to say, like, if I cut my arm off and throw it outside, am I outside? Yeah. Um, if I, if I, you know, if I had, like, five shots of espresso before this interview, would I be giving different answers? Maybe. You know, if I dropped acid, definitely, <laughs> you know, so, so all of these things, these factors that, that play into who and what we are at any given moment in an ultimate sense, in that Buddhist sense, we can say, okay, well, there's no, you know, maybe there's, maybe there is no ultimate uh, reality to us either. But you see, the Buddhists are, are very clear about this kind of thing. And they say, look, there's ultimate truth. And then there's relative truth. And don't, don't try to confuse these. Like, if you sit there and you meditate and you real you you have this unknowing of of self existence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you realize your interconnectedness to all things. You realize that under all the layers of the onion that is you, there is in fact just fucking onion. Like, there's nothing in the center of an onion but onion. Like, if you have that don't then stand in the middle of the highway because there's no you to get hit by a car because the relative truth is <laughs> right so in that in that sense spirits are like this they're organized consciousness so are we what are they organized around that's the that's a question but we are spirits right mm -hmm. we are spirits and so you know, the psychological model, one of the things that I've been, that's been driving me nutty since the 90s, um, and, and I mean, this idea of like psychology and magic and, and energy and magic, it's really not bad. It's in and of itself, it's not bad. These things can play a role. And, I, and in the book, I kind of talk about like a brief history. I'm like, look, people just believed in spirits as like, sometimes just physical beings like they they enter into our world and and mess stuff up and kidnap people and have sex with us and all that kind of stuff and then 
go back to where they came from and or 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 as other living beings and then that seemed kind of unscientific as we started to deal with all these other unseen forces right so once we start doing radio waves and tesla coils and things like this in the 1800s it seems like well energy maybe it's maybe energy has something to do with this right and then of course at around the same time you've got jung and and freud and um even to the modern day i i just i skipped it because i didn't want to be in a hotel uh during covid times but just here in vermont we just had a conference about uh psychotherapy and zen right mm -hmm. like how non-dualism can affect uh psychotherapy so the ideas of like the mind having all this depth to it then people can be like ah well you know maybe that's a good extra that's that's scientific ish mm -hmm. that sounds more sciencey than uh than there's ghosts everywhere and you know every day that you're you know accidentally grinding up spirit booty like oh excuse, you know so we kind of run with that and the whole 20th century kind of got carried away and then um, you know, it, it comes to its fruition in chaos magic. And, and then Freighter UD comes along and he's like, all right, all right, all right, listen, 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 guys. So you have spirits, right? And then you have energy, right? And you have psychology. And then you have the information model where it's like mo it's like data. Mm -hmm. You know, we can think of that being influenced obviously by, by the digital revolution um and so he's like so listen 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 you know i'm i'm gonna resolve all this with a meta model because in the 90s we just fucking loved meta anything man like anything you can do i can do meta that was like the 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 if it was meta then chaos magicians loved it and it was sciencey sounding and you know, so we take all these things and we're like, and he's like, listen, you know, spirits exist in the spirit model and energy in the, in the model. So you shift, you paradigm shift your mind that there is this meta thing going on in the world. And, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I love Freighter UD. I think he's done great contributions, but this is really silly. Like, I feel like we're arguing about whether my car runs on gasoline or electricity or oil <laughs> or, or just, you know, mechanics like the mechanics of the wheel. And that to somehow resolve all this, we need a meta model where if you're filling up your car, then it runs on gas. And if you're doing something else, it only runs on electric. It's like, no, we need, we don't need fuck meta. We don't need meta. We need mega. We need big. We need just need to think of the simple idea that we don't know everything. Hmm. And in fact, I've gone so far as to say magicians, philosophers, spirits, we just kind of need to stop worrying about truth of fact, like we have great systems for verifying this. And, and worry about truth of meaning and truth of usefulness and, and just like, let the scientists worry about the fact. Like if we come up with a verifiable system that satisfies everybody, we can start worrying about that. But so, you know, I mean, the truth is, sure, energy plays a role in magic and mind plays a role in magic. When you're doing a spell, your concentration plays a role in it. But you know what? The spirit also has spirits also have energy and they also have mind and their concentration might play a role. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, and so then like in the 2000s, we had the great grimoire revolution and people got back to like offerings and spirits and and, uh, you know, and now we're kind of, you know, more than 20 years into that. And it's kind of like going off the rails in its own way where people are like having like fantasies that Hecate is mad at them for something and you know something innocuous like you know they asked Hecate to do something that Hecate is well known to do and then the next day I felt a cold spot so clearly I am cursed for life 
Um, and so you've got these kinds of things where it's like we projected these very human, very myopic, sometimes really petty personalities on spirits. Um, and it's like, well, that's not it either. You're, you're, you're making them less subtle. So, you know, uh, I guess I just, I don't put much stock in any of the models of magic. And whenever I try to think about facts, about true, what I call head, heart, hand, right? The hand yeah. knows what's useful. The heart knows what's meaningful. The head just wants to know where, where it is and what it is. Like, give me the facts. And whenever I think, whenever magicians and philosophy and religion kind of forays into that fact finding, it, it always just goes wrong, right? Yeah. Like Plato gave us the allegory of the caves, really meaningful. And, and Aristotle gave us probably the best definition of friendship that anyone has come up with since he lived really meaningful and useful stuff and then every time that they open their mouths about how the physical world actually worked they were wrong man they were really really wrong and the thing is you couldn't say that they were wrong because like if you were like well you know hey maybe the planets move in ellipses stoner <laughs> Or, you know, I, you know, I think maybe we revolve around the sun, not the other way around. Stone them! Um, you know, like we lost a thousand years to that shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I know exactly, I mean, I know exactly what you mean. And I grew up with the idea that those models were useful because I think I was coming from a head uh, perspective, as you say. As I grow older, and maybe as I do more magic, I'm getting more both i don't know between the hand and the head and the heart i would say i i'm more interested i'm less interested in the head right i'm more interested in what's useful what can you do and how how that enriches my experience and my i don't know understanding of 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 reality and of the experience of life really because that's what i perceive magic to be about like a, getting an understanding of why we're here what we're doing maybe where we're going right on that note, like I have a question from uh, one of my patrons, Mark, uh, and he touches on, you know, like we, we kind of discussed this, but um, he wants to ask, ask you, what are your thoughts on spirit that come from fiction, right? Like those of, well, the Necronomicon current, uh, which became very popular to, well, I, I, I hear you work with it. Uh, Peter Lavenda definitely worked with it. Um, and uh, also, what are, what are your thoughts uh, with your relationship within spirits and the U UFO experiences? Like, do you see, do you, what are those? Are those spirits or something else? Or is this another head question? All right, so, so let's take the UFO thing and we'll just side table it. I have zero opinion. I, have, I, I don't even have the base knowledge to form an opinion. Yeah. Um, certain experiences I had when I was younger that led me into this, other people have been like, you know, that sounds like UFO abductee experience. So I'm willing to say, hey, maybe there's some commonality there, but I don't have enough uh, knowledge or interest to to weigh in one way or the other. So just you know, hey, you you're I don't espouse on things that I don't know anything about. Um, now the fiction question is interesting, right? So it really depends because there's kind of two ways, two two avenues for magic and fiction to cross. Okay. So let's take, let's, let's take the example, really three ways now that you think about it. But anyway, let's, um, who doesn't love a three way? So it's three ways, we'll just make it that. And um, so let's, let's take a look at it this way. So a fiction writer can be inspired by direct spirit contact. And then because they write fiction, they transmit some of that in their fiction, right? Now, this is what a lot of people lay on Lovecraft and they'll, they'll find journal entries where he talks about how this comes to him in dreams and therefore, you know, and, and 
you know, for me, sure, that that's uh, that's valid. And then you got you kind of got to lay on that and say he wasn't the greatest writer of all time. Um, why is he so well known? Why did people hunger for a Necronomicon so much that they started popping up? like the Owl Press Necronomicon, the Hay Necronomicon, the Simon Necronomicon, the, you know, Bell's Necronomicon. There were, like, the very fact that there were so many hoaxes, so many ways that this is bubbling up. And then, of course, you've got people like Grant and, and the recently passed Linda Florio, um, who tied their work on the night side of the tree to whatever was also inspiring Lovecraft. So the question then becomes, is there a there there, right? Like, is there a there there? So in other words, it's spirits that are inspiring the fiction. Now, does this mean that there's like, that he got the names right? No, I, I don't think it's useful to call upon Cthulhu digging through the Lovecraft texts for details of where Rilyeh is and uh, and things like that. I don't think that's useful at all. I mean, maybe if you wanted to to play around with stuff and just realize that these are masks for something that's really kind of interesting. It's interesting to think about how large the physical universe is, right? Like we all have these multi-plane models, yet somehow we're all really, really important in the in these multi-plane models. But even just the one universe that science can agree upon is so big, and we're so dinky, not really the center of anything, that the the cause the spirit that is conveyed through Lovecraft is appealing. Yeah. It's cosmic horror, not because these things are evil, but because they're so vast and so unconcerned with us that it doesn't matter. Uh, that, you know, that we don't matter. They're not anthropocentric spirits necessarily. So maybe you want to work with them and get to know this, what is beyond being human, get to know things from a non-human perspective. Or maybe that's just garbage, you know, it, it's it's up to you. So, but on the other side, you've got let's take Batman, right? Batman isn't the inspiration of a spirit saying, "Make a superhero who dresses as a bat, man." You know, he he's just cool, right? He's cool. He, Doctor Strange is cool. Love Doctor Strange. Think he's awesome. But there's no there there. There's no spirit behind no. Doctor Strange other than comic book writers going like, this would be freaking awesome. So then what do you do? Well, some people like me, you know, you get to a certain point in your studies and I look around at the comics I loved as a kid. I love Doctor Strange. I love Mandrake the Magician. I love... Uh, you know, all these guys, what did they do? Oh, they went east to, to learn, to further their magical studies, the shadow, you know, I'm going to go do, so I moved to Nepal, right? But I learned what they were teaching in Nepal. I, but other people kind of sit around and they go like, I love Dr. Strange. So I'm going to worship the Vashanti and I'm going to wear an eye of Agamotto that I bought at Think Geek. And I'm going to pretend all this is real and make it real. There's no there there. Yeah. It's not real. I mean, maybe you can focus a little bit of your spirit through that. But honestly, you're fighting an uphill battle. And I have argued that because spirit, because magic is so subtle, right? It's, it's subtle. It's not something that, that science agrees is, is real. So by definition, all, you know, the results you get, yes, there's occasional undeniable miracles. There are occasional manifestations that everyone in the room can see. But the day in, day out isn't like that. The day in and day out, or it would be on the news. So it's subtle. And because it's subtle, we kind of, as magicians, witches, sorcerers, sorceresses, sorcerixes, Pick your gnomer, I don't really care. Um, and because of that, we kind of have a duty to be like, 
let's let's not climb into fantasy land any more than we have to. Like we already have to kind of delve a little bit into that pool. Let's not let's not just fall in. Let's actually bring this real. My wife just she she was looking at some business book and she looked up at me and she's like, "Do you have a mission statement?" And I just said, no. And I'm like, but how about this? I try to get normal people to think more magically and magical people to think more normally. <laughs> I love this. This is fantastic. <laughs> and so that's that's my new mission statement. Um, and it it's it's the kind of thing where, you know, so I have this reputation of like, yes, I have I did a class on uh Necronomicon spirits, and I used to belong to the esoteric order of Dagon and all that jazz. But at the same time, I also have this very hard line in my group, like, we don't discuss fictional magic systems. I don't want to talk about how much belief that you invest into Superman. It's it's not a thing we do. Like, yeah, go, go do it somewhere else. No, I mean, I... I... I had my experience with fictional magic when I was in my early 20s. Uh, for a while, I was a member of the Dragon Rouge, uh, and there were a lot of like going to the seaside and evoke Dagon, for instance, which it did lead to an interesting experience, but possibly because, as you said, like, you know, beyond Dagon itself, there, there, is, an, there is an old Phoenician Dagon. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? So that's something that, yeah, that definitely re responded. You know, that experience in particular, back when I was very young, <laughs> 20 odd years ago. Well, that's the third way. You just nailed it, right? Dagon. Yeah. Maybe they're approaching it from a Lovecraft angle, but Dagon is real. He's real. Right? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> exactly. You can, you can look at Thor as a Marvel character, but Thor is also a real god. There's a there there. Yeah. And so you maybe you have a little Thor picture, you know? No, no, absolutely. One thing, something. Yeah, you say, nailed that third way. <laughs> unfortunately, I nailed it. I guess because, like, you know, my, my experience there wasn't great. In fact, I I, I spoke once. Like, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great experience. It's not something that I should have done. Like, a, as a, a younger magician. And something that I really like in your book is that at the very beginning, you mentioned the fact that uh, consorting with spirits shouldn't be your first magical book. Um, and you also say not because maybe it's very complex, but because you should approach, you know, approach, you know, working with spirit uh, when you have a little bit more millage under, under, you know, under your your car, whatever you wanna you wanna say. Um, can you expand that a little bit more? Why do you think that's the case? So yeah, so you know, I um, I decided not to do a chapter on protection in the book. Um, and, and instead I replaced it with a chapter on fear because I see, you know, whereas in, in the era you and I came up with and, and the, even in the era where I wrote protection and reversal magic, my first book, right? Like everybody was like, psychic attack isn't, doesn't really happen very often. If ever you would need to be an advanced adept who wouldn't want to psychically attack anyone to be able to do a psychic attack. And, uh, you know, so, so it just, it's not something anyone needs to worry about. And anyone who thinks they're psychically attacked is obviously just a lunatic because spirits aren't even real anyway. And, you know, this is all just magic and is in the mind. And, and, and so I wrote protection and reversal magic to say, well, no, this is actually like done commonly. It's time tested. It's, it's a long part of witchcraft. Um, you know, people do it like anyone who sells the stuff for it can tell you the stuff sells. <laughs> like, you know, so people are using it. And so I wrote that book then. And then, but now we've kind of undergone this metamorphosis where everyone thinks they're under attack at all times because they summoned a spirit and then the spirit showed up so they're under attack run <laughs> and it's just it's like you know sarah mastros who get wonderful you should have her on if you haven't already 
Um, she calls this ding dong ditch with the spirits. Like you ring the doorbell and then they answer and you run away. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's so apt. It's so spot on. Um, and so I, I probably use that line more than her, but you know, I'm big in, into giving credit where credit's due. So it, it's, it's a great line and it's so true. So I wrote about fear because, you know, we all kind of know we don't live in a Harry Potter universe, right? Like I, we don't shoot fireballs out of our fingers and, and Avada Kedavra doesn't kill anyone. Um, but we, you know, so many of us think we do live in a horror movie where like magic and spirits only exist to get us in trouble. So the idea is that all these grimoires are here and they will summon a spirit, but the dismissal won't work. Like, it's just, you know, it like the tech is there to get you in trouble and then you will die. Um, and, and so, you know, Hecate is there for you to, to pray for and then she will just ruin your life. I mean, would and, you say that this is also because of the fact that in the last 20 odd years, uh, all horror movies is about that. All paranormal TV, which I don't, you know, I don't watch, right? But um, recently, in the last two years, because of the lockdowns, I discovered Hellier, and then I discovered 20 years of paranormal TV that I didn't know existed. And it's all demons, and it's all like the, the, the worst things that happen out there. It kind of also harkens back to, I mean, what you read in traditional grimoires, I mean, you know, they were written by clergy and they were they were scared of what they were going to <laughs> to yeah. do right right and and you know i mean being having a healthy healthy attitude of i need to be able to protect myself is really why the book isn't for beginners like you yeah. should be able to handle something moderately going wrong you should be yeah. able to handle a, a local spirit not liking you yeah and and be able to say well then screw off right like there was a, a somebody in the strategic sorcery group they recently tried the spirit feast that i outlined which is just sort of like lay it out invite them hey here's a big offering like these are the classes of guests and uh come partake and then according to them, and I'm not speaking to their, you know, like, I don't know, I, I don't know them personally. I don't, I don't play the, I believe everything you say card, nor do I disbelieve. But according to them, the spirits showed up and were like, more, we want big expensive offerings and we want them or we'll kill you. And, you know, and so thankfully this person is in the strategic sorcery community and, and took the course, the strategic sorcery course, where we talk about not yielding your sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? Like just because spirits are real and they want something just like with people doesn't mean that you have to give it to them. Right. Uh, and if gods give you, even if the gods give you something, if it turns out something that you didn't really want, you don't have to keep it and live with it. Right. Um, so, you thank them and then toss it out and try try something new. Like this isn't really what I wanted. So thanks, good effort, good effort. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, thank you so much. Um, but now I'm gonna go shopping again. Uh, no, so, you know, it's that kind of thing is why you should be able to handle these things. We don't invite people to our house. We don't have a big party like where we invite the neighborhood unless we know that we can call the cops should somebody go crazy or or have a couple big friends nearby um you know i i used to hang out in the 90s with tiffany at witch lab i don't know if you know her but you know i've heard of her yeah 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 so we were we were recalling that you know we were actually at a party and i was like look i conjured by invitation by saying, hey, look, there are these offerings of beer and snacks. And we conjured through invitation, like, come if you'd like. And then people showed up. And then one person needed to be constrained by force. And so me and two other guys, because I wasn't trying to have a fight fight, like, you know, just punched him, dragged him, and threw him down three flights of stairs and locked him out. Simple, easy. 
You know, that that's conjuring through constraint. We conjured him out the door, exercised him. So I you have to be able to have some something in your toolbox to handle slight things going wrong. You mentioned that right now we're living in a moment of you know the magical revival if there is magical revival let's say that whereby everybody is you know scared that everyone is out there to get them um let's not go on whatever happened on TikTok or witch talk or the social media in general but my point is is there my question is there a moment where maybe too much banishing too much protection makes the spirit content impossible right in the sense that you know maybe yes we 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 did our our um, you know beginners courses or read our beginners books uh we've worked through our you know i don't know strengthening our body of light which maybe is my my thing i mean that's one thing that i teach so that we have like our circle right Right. But then we start banishing constantly, like banishing three times, four times, so that you know we're very sure that you know we have all the the checks and balances in case something goes wrong. Would wouldn't that be problematic? Like wouldn't why would spirits show up if if there's too much of that, right? It's it it becomes a barrier. I, I would never say impossible. I, I very rarely say impossible. So you know, and, and the reality is, I mean, I've done conjurations back in the day when I was doing an LBRP twice a day and a BRH once a day. And, you know, so there I am every day waking up, banishing all the earthbound spirits with a pentagram and then banishing all the positive and, and, and uh, you know, Don Craig would just say positive or, or planetary influences with the hexagram just so that I'm living in some kind of like clean room, like John Travolta in that movie, The Boy with the Bubble. Uh, it's really, I'm aging myself here, but- um, I got it, so we are- yeah, so, <laughs> Well, you're an old son of sod as well. But um, so, you know, I mean, they, but, and then sure, we can reach through that and say, but you, Astaroth, you come here you know, I'm, I'm gonna pull you in. But then, yeah, it like the barrier to communication can be higher. Um, some people have argued it's lower because you've made this clean room and then, you know, you've, you've opened this window for this particular spirit to come in. And now it's just, you know, that to me, like when I was doing that Golden Dawn kind of magic, kind of that Don Craig, I was never a member of the Golden Dawn, full disclosure. So, um, but you know, when I started doing the uh, the 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 watchtower ritual, right? And I started doing that every day, not because Don recommended it, just because I loved it. And that was sort of letting it all back in, but and 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 mixing it all up. And so that's when really like, wow, okay, the, you know, I'm getting more of a tangible result here. But in the end, um, I came around to, you know, study some systems of magic that are not based in the Golden Dawn or Thalema or Wicca. And, you know, I just realized that this incessant and constant banishing is not really a thing and that there's more of an effort to get to know and relate yeah. to the spirits. Um, and so it becomes like, that's when I started to say, hey, do a spirit feast every day instead. Like, like get to know, build allies, get to know the locals and get a feel for everything in all those models. Get a feel for the energy, the mind, not just yours, but, but the mind, the mental level, the, the, the everything that lies under the physical in your environment that you've been telling to GTFO for you know, however long you've been doing it. Um, so, you know, I reserve banishings now for, uh, like, are you under attack or do you think you might be? Banish, you know, banish every sunset and sunrise. Not a bad thing for a little while. Like banish, fix it, get an amulet, cleanse, do all that. 
take a break, you know, make sure yourself up, heal a little bit, you know, that that's important too. Um, Like take a little time, heal, and then get back in, you know, into the more active stuff a a little while later. But um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think, I think you, 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 pretty much explained it very well. Yeah. Um, one question from Melissa, and it's a very specific one here. Um, she says, she's asking, around page 116 of your book, uh, Jason talks about using the names of the Deccans as an authorita- authoritative power to appeal if you don't want to appeal to the Christian God or, or if you're trying to call, and you're trying to call a demon. But whenever I look about decans, it's all about making talismans to attract material goods. What if I just want inside or information? Can I talk to? Can I just talk to it? So I guess the question is like, can we speak to decans? Can we invoke decans even if we don't want material things from them? I suppose. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you could. Why not? Um, you know, I would look at the work of Austin Kopak and the, the, his book on the Deacons, which, um, you know, honestly, if I was, I, I, if I wasn't stuck in the old ways, I might've like incorporated more of his work into the conjurations where I use the Deacons, but because I started using the Deacons back when I was a kid with my copy of Mastering Witchcraft. And, and you know, this is, I mean, this is, this is how dumb I am too and and but not really dumb we just we didn't have the internet like in the 80s so we we couldn't just look things up so you know i'm using by satan dollar and a synthesizer and i'm like oh those are cool witchy names like you know i'm gonna trust that paul Houston knows what they mean (laughs) and so then you know like in the age of email i'm like you know paul what's the deal with these names? And he's like, they're deacons of the Zodiac, dude. Like, open up 7-7, read a book. And I'm like, oh, God, so dumb. And you're, you know, so, but then it was like, oh, right. So I don't, I'm not just stuck with the Sago in these names. I can use these for any of the 72 spirits of the Goetia if I can match them up correctly. And so I provide that handy help chart in the book. Um, and so, you know, that was cool, but, but you could certainly take that further. Um, but you know, it really then comes down to what are you going to ask them? Like, what do you want to know? Do you want to know how to time something that you're doing? That's useful, right? Like if, if you think that the deacon, like a particular deacon might be rule over a period of time that some, you want to do something that's useful. So sure, go for it. Um, if you're if you're trying to get some kind of sense of of feeling time, right? So that you can you can maybe empower yourself to uh, get a sense for how magic manifests through time, which is something that is really quite useful. Uh, Or just to make yourself right with time, like a ritual for the deacons to kind of say, okay, you know, we're going to empower you. And then you go to another one and, and, and maybe give you information and empower you, make you right with time so that you're, you're, you just start to be in the right place at the right time. People who take Kala Chakra empowerment sometimes do it just for this side benefit of kind of like getting right with the cycles of time. Um, but you know then if it's about well i want to know the facts i want to know exactly what the mansions of the moon look like and where they are and how does god work and that's where it goes back into those sort of like okay you know knock yourself out but you know you're going to come out with a theology that's you know cool maybe or but is it but, useful, right? Like, like yeah. is, is it useful? Is it actionable? Does it give you something that makes life better? You know, I use the example of Metatron. Like if Metatron himself came down in bodily form, like like Alan, like Rickman 
from, from dogma <laughs> and could like slap me around and then actually like whipped out a magical dry erase board and was like this is where god is this is how the heavens work and how all the universal clockwork stuff manifests your universe um and where all the spirits are and things like that and then i was like so how do i do magic with that and he's like you don't really i'm just telling you how everything in the world really works and then he left but he left the magical dry erase board made of gold i would just be like fuck it like why like why should i believe this guy like just because he manifested and told me he was metatron and then gave me a bunch of unverifiable gobbledygook <laughs> I, that's like i don't believe you what's like I think we just no. reached I, we, we just re reached the the classic level of ereticism that I always try to strive for in this podcast. So thank you, Jason. We got it. Fantastic. Uh, we have one question from Andy, and she's asking, "Oh, uh, if you have any suggestion for nurturing and maintaining a relationship with a spirit once it's established?" Yeah, um, you know the biggest the so the first thing is. Think about how you nurture and maintain your relationships with people. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of people and all kinds of relationships. And generally speaking, you only get to know a couple sides of those people. And they have other sides that they show to other people and in, in, in other contexts, right? Um, but think about what you do. What do you do to keep friendships? Well. You, you want to catch up with them every couple of weeks. You want to you wanna take each other out. You want to do things for each other and not you worry about like tit for tat, unless it's an acquaintanceship, like at work or something. And then maybe you do want that kind of relationship. That's a real relationship too. Like, you know, I don't actually want to make you a friend. I want to know who you are and, and have an inside track, but no, I don't want, you over my house right like it might be good to know the local mob boss and know his name but you don't want him hanging out all the time because tony <laughs> soprano's friends always wind up getting into trouble um so this is the kind of thing where you you just look at it like another relationship now so the regularity like like not constant conjuring but realize too that you don't always need the fullest most balls to the wall manifestation of a spirit for it to be in your life some spirits um don't like that in fact most historical examples of evocations we have the spirits are like can we end this? Like, can, this is uncomfortable. I'm really not happy to be conjured down into this. Like, it's like, you know, like I am a vast deity and you're forcing me to the, appear at the edge of your circle like I'm a goddamn ghost. Like, it, it doesn't, it's round peg, square notch. It doesn't feel good. Let's get this over with. I realize that you need to hear me talk so i can talk but then maybe next time you just pray and and i'll hear you and if i come through then you'll know i heard and yeah, and you yeah. don't need me to actually just like go answer a three hour long conjuration for something that melissa can do with folk magic <laughs> um you know so it's 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 like that um so you think about regularity you think about honoring you think about what makes that spirit happy, what a good relationship would be, and then you go about and make that happen. Start with simple offerings that every that 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 most spirits like, some kind of libation poured into the ground or some kind of generic incense uh, that floats up into the sky. Um, if you're conjuring them along with other spirits, like a spirit feast, then, having an offering there that that spirit doesn't like is totally excusable. Like, like if I go to Marco's house and, and there's a big party and Marco has something there that I don't like, and he knows I don't like, 
I'm not going to complain. It's a big party. Other people like it. So whatever. If, however, he invites me over and he is like, I have cooked this specially for you and we're going to sit down. It's this thing that I know that you, that is going to make you throw up then I have every right to be offended, right? So if we're, if we're inviting like all the classifications of spirits, then we can have, we can be a little loose. But if we're specifically talking to the Nagas, then we want to make sure there's no musk in the incense. We want to make sure there's no meat offerings of any kind. We want to make sure that, you know, Tibetans would say that you don't eat eggs even within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, and then, but then that too, do things change over time? The protocols that people have with some people, they may not have with other people. And the way that Nagas behave in Nepal may not be how Nagas behave over here. Um, they're more subtle than we are, not less. So whenever people are like nailing them down, I'm always like, this is like human beings are more subtle than this. So why don't you just get a little looser, but, but go for respect. Respect is respected. That's the big thing. So there you that's, go. that's a very good point. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this down. Since you were speaking about parties, right? I have a question from Peter here. And it's, it's uh, Peter is always great because he gave us like the best questions on these rambles. If you, All could, right. if you could attend a party host by spirits, which one would you want to be in charge of organizing it? Wow. Oh my goodness. Who would be my Virgil? Um, there, you know, there's so many, um, you know, I, 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 at times, like I would love to go to a party hosted by Astaroth. Um, I know Astaroth is, is, you know, very, very like sexy demoness. Still has me use Astaroth, not Astarte, but, but clearly there's a, a lot of Astarte that comes through. So, uh, yeah, you know, that would be, that would be a lot of fun. Um, then at other times, uh, I want the, the kind of the heady conversations and, and, uh, and, and the heart space. Uh, so it really depends on what I want in the party. Like Sarah, I would, Sarah Kali's party would be amazing to go to, but I imagine there would be, it would be less of an orgy than, uh, Astaroth, you know, um, but it would be it would definitely be like this really kind of heart space where you felt Good. cared for and, and and loved like you know um and then you know god just just some of the you know the sabbath you know i mean that is a party thrown by spirits like the devil's party you know i mean who doesn't want to go to that so well, you know, he, here, here, in, here on the, on the Magic Without Tears community, we, um, uh, we, we did like a path working the last two years on Valpurgis Nacht, you know, going to the broken, and uh, we always had good time there. <laughs> like, so, yeah, yeah I would absolutely. say like the, the Witch's Sabbath is definitely, it's definitely a good party to be. Uh, we have one final question. This is from Anna, and we're, we're leaving spirits behind now. Uh, we're going, we're just going to ask you, one question of maybe general or culture, because this is something we discuss a lot here on, on the Rambles. And what do you think are the responsibilities of modern occult teachers? And why is the occult beset by lunatics? Okay, so, um, you know, let, let me, that, that, let me just, that Sabbath that you mentioned, and, and before we were talking about the fiction and spirit cross like think about the witch, the movie, like uh. <laughs> how many devotees have worked? Wouldst thou like to live deliciously? Yeah. In, like, is that inspired? Maybe, you know, was it inspired by old scratch and then worked into the movie? Was it just the writer coming up with something great and then old scratch being like, I like that. I'm going to use that and kind of elevating it. Or are we just grasping onto it because it means something to us 
and then we're throwing it at the devil and the devil's like yeah sure okay you know you want to live deliciously i can i can manage that uh that it's such a it's such a wonderful thing yeah. and and to say i don't need to know the facts i just need to know what's meaningful and useful about it is freeing and it also keeps you away from sounding like a lunatic where you're come down that this is this way anyway back to the real back to the question what are the responsibilities of an occult teacher you know there are so many different ways to be an occult teacher it's really hard so i would say this that your responsibilities are to be straight with whoever it is that you're teaching to 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 make it clear what you get out of it um and what you expect from folks at the outset and uh to to anything to to run anything that you think you might want to do through the filter of how will this serve the people that i'm teaching to i mean listen i I have fairly expensive courses and and I am I am not at all opposed to people making a not just a living but a good living like a solid living uh teaching the occult I I'm really not I think I actually think it's a good model because my students know that what I want from them is this fee and I'm not going to hit them up to to sleep with them i'm not going to hit them up to um to to pressure them to cut my lawn and i'm not going to be uh you know playing favorites and 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 games and things like this about oh well you know uh you so and so has served me so they get such and such and and whatnot so um, I actually really like the business model. Like, just this is what it costs. This is what it is. If I don't deliver, then say this guy doesn't deliver on what he says, um, and and then it'll be taken care of, right? Like, like people, it'll get around. Um, so that's the responsibility, you you know. And there's so much. You know, there, there's there's weird things that sometimes people go and project onto teachers that they shouldn't. There, there was just a Vice article about a woman that I don't know. She may be like the worst crazy cult leader in the world. But I read the article because I'd never heard of her. And the main objection seems to be that she tells people to imagine themselves dying. No. And this could be triggering to people who are suicidal yes it could but it's also a really old and time-tested multicultural practice that exists all over the world like it's not a even just a buddhist or a christian or like it's everywhere this is this is a really common practice and if somebody comes to her and says, you know, I'm having suicidal thoughts and she says to do this, then yeah, absolutely nail her to the wall. She, she's practicing, uh, you know, not only is she trying to be a psychologist and clearly she's not, but she's uh, like doing incredible damage. But if it's, if it's just like, well, this is the exercise and I teach it openly and then somebody goes and they have a bad experience, well, she should have known because she's the spiritual teacher who knows all and sees all. Well, that's not really fair or, or realistic. And I've seen that. I've seen that with people, they've gone to Tibetan lamas and they're like, but I assumed that he would know because he's enlightened. And I'm like, listen, Lopen Tenzin Namdak is a very wise person, but he's also a monk. So he doesn't know dick about being married and he doesn't know dick about burning a business. And he can give you a reading, but even then the interpretation isn't necessarily going to be all that useful. I don't know what you were expecting thinking, from them. Yeah. Like, you know, just taking the advice without like, like any other. Um, 
so, you know, the student has some responsibility to not just assume that occult teachers are, are ineffable and wise in all things. I mean, I've had people like, you know, I don't know why, what lesson you're trying to teach me. You didn't answer my email, or maybe I've angered you, or maybe you're teaching me a lesson. And I'm like, no, I just missed your email because I'm, you know, it was a mistake and, and, you know, I'm sorry. Um, Can I like, say something? Was, Can you I... know, I'm not even talking about the ones where I complain about it. I'm like, this is like my mistake, my error. This happened um, to me as well, and and it's it's, right. it's I think it's Gmail's problem or whatever it is. Right? Not a, you know I'm not even going to blame anyone but me. But but so you know I mean there there is this sort of thing there, um, and th but then that leads open to why does the the other part of the question why is the occult attractive to wackadoodles? Um, because it is subtle because it allows people to engage multiple harmful fantasies that play off one another and they cannot be challenged. So, you know, while, while when I wrote Protection Reversal Magic, I wanted to let people know, hey, psychic attack does happen. And then, like I said, nowadays, everyone is like, oh my God, I'm psychically attacked for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and, and then I went to five different readers and they all tell me somebody is, different is attacking me. So now I know that there are five people attacking me for no reason. Like there's no, and so you think about this and think about what like the attractiveness of being in this situation is. You are simultaneously you are at one time the most important person because all these people want to get you and the spirits want to get you and the gods are showing up because they want you to act and do something because you're so important. It, and you are helpless about your life conditions because the spirits, gods, evil magicians are messing with you because you're so important. So you've got the benefit and the ego boost of being really, really important and the, the, the excuse of never having to take responsibility for anything because you're a victim. And this, by the way, is not victim blaming. There are real victims in the world. And, and I wanna be clear about this that, you know, like this isn't Tony Robbins telling the assault victim like she needs to let go of her victim mentality. The woman was a victim. Um, so, you know, like I don't tell people like, go I mean, there's victim mentality maybe where you make it the center of your persona, but, but to just say, let go that you're a victim is just ridiculous. Like, like bad shit happens to good people through no fault of their own. Um, and so this is, this is a condition of life on earth. Um, so I don't, I don't mean to, to play that yeah, card yeah. for people, but for sure, there are people who are like, you know, I, I can't do anything useful because I'm beset by, by set, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am beset by set and the temple of set. So get set. But there That's you go. Funny. I I guess we we now have uh, we have we now have a scapegoat, which is I mean a traditional scapegoat, I would say, right. and and we we come a full circle, and now we know know at the end of at the end of this of this little chat that you know it's all Seth's problem, and that's it. We're gonna set it right. We're gonna set and, it right, right. <laughs> and, and magic magic allows you to know the facts, like we've been talking about the head, heart, and hand. It allows you to know the facts, the unknowable facts. I know what's real because the spirits told me <laughs> it, it's the methods of science and the aim of religion but it's not <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. like the first step if it was the method of science is just going like yeah we don't know all that much um and we've got a lot of work to do you know it's um, interesting you mentioned that because you know as a telemite i've been i've been saying very loudly that you know we like it's a nice little slogan but it's not really real, right? <laughs> it's really not. 
Okay, yeah. Jason. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This is this is all the questions we have. You've been so gracious and answered. You, know, you answered everything. <laughs> so, where can people find you? I mean, we 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 know about strategic sorcery. Internet. Tell us more about where we can find you. Oh God. Uh, you know, you can. I, I'm doing more on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably doing more on Instagram. Like like not doing it right because I don't use stories or carousels or anything else. I just. I, I, you know, but um, what's interesting is I am finding kind of a groovier vibe there and people are responding and, and uh, so, you know, I might be on Instagram more than Facebook in the future, although I love to, you know, Facebook allows you to make long posts and yeah. I'm all about length. Um, I think I, I, I have no interest in Twitter. Um, a friend of mine recently pointed out that I have a Twitter because it's set up to mirror certain posts from Facebook, but I, I'm never on it. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on email, strategicsorcery at gmail.com. And I guess and, uh, that's that's the best way where because every time I mail you, I always get a reply that says that's the best way for people to find you. So you heard it here. It if you want to speak with Jason, email him. That's the best it way. Is. If you if you go to my author page on Facebook and like DM me, you'll get an auto responder that says I don't answer DMs here. <laughs> and I wish I could put that everywhere else because sometimes people are like, you know, I'm trying everything to get a hold of you, except the email <laughs> well let's say their divination didn't work out clearly there uh once again jason thank you so much and all of you who've been listening thank you for being for yet another episode of uno sprechen rumbling and we'll see you next month good night thanks everyone for coming what a good show